too many years, I made a lifestyle because uh, I was encouraged to and because I, I had a, a weakness of character that allowed me to, I suppose, take advantage of the situation, you know. So I was able to, um, you know, uh, be abusive with alcohol and drugs and bad behaviour and, and got away with it because I had some sort of licence given to, you know, when you're a singer in a rock and roll band with, that with my reputation or the, my band's reputation, it was it was okay, it was accepted. And, and this is the mistake we're making with sportsmen and women, I might add, um, where they behave badly but they're exonerated or they're excused or accommodated because they're, they're highly strung, highly paid, <laughs> highly strung athletes that are very, very... I, I'm, I'm overhearing sports commentators defending the bad behaviour of males, particularly in football, whether it be soccer or AFL, like Aussie rules or, or league or union. And they're saying, well, you know, they're, they're very young men, they're given a lot of money and, you know, and yes, they do go out and do this and do that. Well, the thing about it is that's kind of subtly saying it's OK. Well, it's not. There were painful times. Growing up as a young person and being told that you're weird or that you're a poof uh, and that you're uh, outside the kingdom of God, um, th that is not an easy journey. A and I was a pretty robust type and I had lots of supports. Now, many people are not robust and they don't have lots of supports. So uh, that's why I wanted to send a signal, I'm here to support you. And uh, gay people are not just hairdressers and uh, actresses. They're people in every walk of life, uh, up to the, the level of a prime minister and, and they're garbage collectors and they're all ranges of life. Get over it. It's like being left-handed. Would you punish people for being left-handed? They tried to make my brother Donald, who was left-handed, write with his right hand, and my mum went up to the school and said, don't you dare. Well, that was the attitude of my parents, too, about sexuality. You know, whether we accept it or not, we're products of our own history. And there's, there's this magnificent SBS program called Message Stick, and it's called Red Dust Hurling, in which a group of indigenous guys get together in a program in Taree where they get to actually be taken on a journey where they get to understand the shame, the hurt, not only they cause, but their history is caused to them. And they get to a point where they get to discover uh, that that they couldn't make sense of their own behaviour, that they realised uh, having been rejected, the horrendous shame, they got into drugs, alcohol, ended up in prison, but never got to really understand what was happening for them. And why I'm saying that is individuals who make poor choices, as a general rule, are individuals who lack insight self-awareness. What we do in the criminal justice system is we don't build that self-awareness. We do quite the opposite. What I've discovered is that if you can engage individuals, whether they're offenders, no matter who they are, where they can get to understand what's happening for them. And we make an assumption that they know what they're on about, when in fact most of the time they don't. See, the issue about behaviour, for me, is just a manifestation of what's happening underneath. When people behave inappropriately, the question I ask is, what's going on? My option was to um, apply for conditional bail release. Um, so I did, I applied for conditional bail release. In the third hearing at court, they granted me the conditional bail release under the circumstances that I set my own program. So they could see that I could prove um, that I was um, driven and I set a goal that I wanted to redeem myself and um, give back to the people I'd hurt and the people and the community and um, um, take responsibility and so I did.
I said, yeah, I'm going to do that. So I set my own program and I started off by every day going, I had to report every day to my parole officer. I had to do um, urine tests. Um, and uh, then I had slowly with my parole officer's guidance to set my own curriculum for, for healing and choosing my own um, programs that I wanted to do. So I started off with anger management and then alcohol abuse and drug abuse and, you know, and, you know, self, you know, all that type of stuff. Um, and, yeah. But you had to want to do that. I had to want to do I wanted to do it. You did? I wanted to do it. I was, it wasn't just to get out oh, of no, jail. No, 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 no. Look, I mean, a lot of fellas think jails, they'll go to jail because it's easy. And, uh, you know, it's like what I said at the end of Mad Bastards in the interview. Uh, the biggest fight that I ever had was with myself. And I could go into, like a lot of men, you know, I could go into a bar. I could go into uh, an environment where there was, you know, men twice the size of me and begin to get, get myself into a situation where I had no fear, whether I was sober or intoxicated, and I had no fear. But the biggest fear I had was crossing the threshold to walk into that door to go to that men's group and put my hand up and go, yeah, I put my fist through walls, I hit her, I broke that guy's, I hurt that person physically, you know, I did that. So once I did that, I felt like the chains were released from around my, I mean, and that's the, the, that was just the, the, the most, that was the most enlightening time of my life, I could say. And that's, that's, yeah, that's a very special moment in my life when I did that. Well, the, uh, as to the, what one was trying to do was first and foremost to render a little bit more civilised uh, the way in which people were detained in those institutions. It seemed, um, even in a society that materially had progressed as much as Australia had, that the practices, including assaults upon prisoners, uh, unnecessary aggravation of, of, of what of their of their their feelings and so on, that all of this was uh, almost as though it had been handed down directly from the early convict days of this society. So the first and foremost, uh, I wasn't ad I didn't see the major goal as reformation, unlike most other people, and indeed those who attributed it falsely to me. It was really to try and make sure that, in the course of exercising punishment. Uh, which is the only honest way to describe it. Uh, people came out the back door of these institutions no worse than when they went in the front door. And um, along with that, uh, try and help people to acquire some habits like work, um, try and sort out some of their personal problems if possible with professional staff and so on. But I would say the overriding aim was to be civilised. And one thing I say with my sons is, look, parties late on a Saturday night, whatever, if there's confrontation in the air, if there's, if there's violence, just walk away. You just, no, you just don't need that shit, you know? Serious things happen, bad things happen, and people do things. And good people do bad things because there's that spontaneous combustion and it just bursts out. And you need, you need to have that sense of there's danger here, There'll be young men who'll be watching this who know in their hearts they are good, good young men, but they have made a mistake and now society is saying, well, you've got to pay for that mistake. Hopefully one of the things to learn is to avoid those situations. If there's danger in the air, if there's violence in the wind, just move away. Yeah, look, for me, I think as a 15-year-old, uh, I had a lot less taken away from me. If I was 18, 19, working all those sort of responsibilities in the prime of my life, I think the situation may have been different. But my attitude at the time was, you know, something really bad happened to me, I've got to make the best out of a bad situation. And so sport was the one thing for me that I love to do more than anything else in the world. It was the one thing that I was the best at over over anything that I did. So um, the, the people at the rehab center sensed this and they got me into sport straight away. So I started off by playing table tennis and swimming and eventually I got introduced to wheelchair rugby and that's where I found my, my true passion. 
and and finding your true passion um, accelerated my rehab, my development. Um, you know, no longer could I play rugby league anymore. Those dreams were shattered. But all of a sudden, I had a, a new dream. I could be the best wheelchair rugby player in the world, and that's what I worked towards through that really tough period. I think it's it's, it's a common place now that um, you know you, you learn from your mistakes rather than your successes, and it's absolutely true. You don't learn much from success at all, except you know, a moment of, uh, of, of <laughs> euphoria. But uh, if you can see why you failed at something and analyse it and say, well, next time I'll do it differently. And I think I've learned bit by bit to, um, as I said, to delegate, to, to w w see what my weaknesses are and fill those gaps with, with expertise. I do get angry about the way masculinity is presented to the younger generation especially. Uh, in movies and uh, so it's a lot to do with violence, uh, with vigilantes, with the good guy against the bad guys. That's okay when you're, you know, a five or six year old, that's kind of nonsense, but uh, it's being pushed more and more to, to adolescence. Uh, and those kind of role models I think are very, very damaging and dangerous. Um, we know that sports heroes have a lot to answer for. Uh, they're aware of that, I think, but it's still too prevalent in the sports culture that, uh, you know, it's, it's all about who can drink the hardest and screw around the most and, you know, uh, that's, that's no kind of a role model. So uh, I think men have a huge, huge responsibility to, provoke, to provide, provide good role models because bad ones can really influence, uh, you know, many, many thousands of kids, I think.